Hello, students of dynamics. Welcome to this introductory lecture talking about polar, which is R theta coordinates, and how we can describe motion using a two-dimensional polar coordinate system. Now, just briefly before we get into kind of polar versus cylindrical, let's go ahead and take a look at these two diagrams. So what we can see here is that cylindrical coordinate systems use a distance away from an origin point, an angle, angular position of that position vector, of that position vector r, and then a third dimension, which is z, which is measuring a vertical distance, in this case it would be a vertical distance, uh, perpendicular to the plane in which r and theta are operating. Okay, that's a cylindrical coordinate system. In a polar coordinate system, we use the same r, turns out to be the same theta, but then our third dimensional unit ends up being a a second angle which is phi. So as we take a look at contrasting these two, what we can see is that in two dimensions they actually have the exact same terms, r and theta. Okay, so fundamentally in two dimensions you can interchange cylindrical or polar when we're talking about these coordinate systems. In three dimensions you need more explicit because they do have a different third dimension. Okay, so getting back to our two-dimensional setting here, Let's go ahead and set things up in a Cartesian coordinate system, x and y, so we can contrast that with our r and theta. Now, a very important part of r theta, while the r and theta axes do move with the particle, their origin point does not. Okay, so in a r theta coordinate system, you must have a non-moving origin point that essentially your r vector is going to rotate around. Okay, so let's assume we have a path that looks something like this and that the um, current position of the particle along that path, let's say, is right here. So what we can do is we can draw a position vector from our origin to our point. Okay, so this is the first um, distance in this coordinate system, is a distance r away from our origin to the current location of the point. And along with r comes an r axis. It goes in the exact same direction. Okay, so there is my r axis coming away from the origin through my point. Now, all of the coordinate systems we've dealt with have been orthogonal coordinate systems, right? Orthogonal meaning that both axes are perpendicular to one another. So our theta axis is going to have to exist along a line perpendicular to r. And the way we decide what direction it's going is we take a look in the problem and see how the problem has specified theta. Now notice on this vector, this theta vector, that I drew it going towards that r vector. Okay, it's important in that direction because it turns out that our theta axis is going to go in the same direction. We call it in the direction of an increasing theta angle. And I'll write that out here in just a second. Okay, so there is my theta axis. Just noting that r and theta are always perpendicular. So let me go ahead and define these in words. We can say that our r axis, so r is our radial axis. And it always goes from the origin through the particle. And then our theta, which is also known as our transverse axes is perpendicular to R, our R axis, in the direction of an increasing theta angle. So let's go ahead and write out this r vector as components. We have that r as a vector is equal to a distance of r 
right? So 100% of the r position vectors in the r axis direction. So it'll have a zero distance in the theta. Okay, once again, this is going to be always using these hard brackets for r theta r and then theta. And then looking at the velocity, okay? So remember that velocity is always going to be perpendicular to the path. Or once again, this is our path of our particle. So we can label this as the overall velocity v. So zooming in here on this overall velocity v, we could break it into components, where one of those components is going to be along the r-axis. We call that v sub r. And the other, the other component is going to be along the theta axis, and we call that v sub theta. Okay, v r and v theta being the components of v. So unlike tangent normal, where 100% of the velocity was in the tangent, now in r theta, we can have actually components in both the r and also the theta. So coming back to my equation, I can write this as the velocity v is equal to, uh, I'll write in kind of general terms here first, let's call this vr comma v theta. Then we can also write that, of course, related to the time rate of change of the r position vector and the theta position vector. Now, the first one's pretty straightforward, okay? So the time rate of change of r is simply r dot. And that's just because the magnitude of r changes with time. But our v theta term is the time rate of change of the direction of r, okay? And so the direction of r turns out to be, um, or time rate of change of direction of r is r times theta dot. Let me start filling in some definitions as we go. So let's say that our um, r dot is defined as the time rate of change. For a shorthand on time rate of change, I'm just gonna write the d dt, okay? So time rate of change of the magnitude of r, okay, so the time rate of change of the length of r. So if r dot is the time rate of change of the magnitude of r, the time rate of change of the direction of r is equal to v theta. So v theta is r times theta dot. That is defined as, once again, the d dt time rate of change of the direction of r. And if we break that down further, of course, r is the length of r. And theta dot turns out to be the angular velocity. You might have seen the angular velocity also written as an omega, kind of a curvy w in physics, okay? So the angular velocity. And let's take a look at actually where this r times theta dot comes from. If we have a circular path, and here is our r vector, then our theta dot, helps define our velocity, which is perpendicular, excuse me, parallel to this path, tangential to this path. So we could label this as V theta. So of course, in circular motion, we're actually gonna find that R dot's equal to zero because there is no change in radius. So 100% of our velocity in circular motion is gonna be in the transverse direction, which is gonna be that V theta. Now, if you remember your arc length function, Okay, so arc length where we could measure a distance, say, along the outside of this curve right here. And so if we knew the radius and we knew that angle, that interior angle, we have to just multiply those two values. Okay, once again, so if we call this S, I call this angle here theta, and of course the same radius there, we could say that S is equal to R times theta. 
So it turns out that our V theta equation, okay, V theta is equal to, basically it's the time rate of change of that angular position. And so the R doesn't change with time, but the theta does. So when you write that V theta is equal to R times theta dot, okay, which is the same thing we have over here. Same thing we have up here. Okay, so that is the time rate of change of the direction of R. Now, the last term that we have, and I'll go ahead and write it here, and then we'll kind of work through the definitions, is going to be the acceleration in R and theta. Now, I'm not going to go through the full derivation here in the notes. The full derivation is in your textbook, so you can take a look in that section of the textbook and see where this comes from. But fundamentally, in order to take a time rate of change of this velocity, we end up having to do a bunch of product rule because we have multiple terms that change with time uh, and some chain rule as well okay so a whole bunch of different things and then we collect all those terms together and it turns out that our acceleration as a vector is the following we have for the r term r double dot minus r times theta dot squared and then in the theta direction, we have r times theta double dot, and this is plus two r dot theta dot. I'll say this is an equation that I never memorize. I always end up looking at the equation sheet, just to make sure I get the pluses and minuses and everything else lined up. But inside of this equation is basically time rates of change of the magnitude of each one of these terms, and then also time rates of change of the direction of each one of these velocity terms. Okay, and then everything's kind of collected all together. So to add to our definition list uh, down the line here, let's also add that our R double dot is defined as the radial acceleration and radial acceleration meaning the time rate of change the length of r is changing okay so the time rate of change of the radial velocity and then we would have um, theta double dot which is the same thing as alpha which is defined as our angular acceleration So if you remember using angular acceleration in physics, this is the same thing, okay? So let me also come over here and just add some units on each one of these. So R dot is always going to be, I'll put a general general term for instead of SI, US customer, we'll just call length per time, okay? So that's a typical velocity we would think of as a velocity. And then we have our um, R times theta dot. This is also a length per time. Now, the angular velocity ends up being in radians per time, often radians per second. That's the most common, or actually the only unit system you want to use is make sure you use seconds for time. Now, we use radians because radians are a ratio of the circumference to the radius. Okay, so radians actually are not an angular measurement. They're a ratio number telling you, like I said, once again, a radian is the ratio of the circumference of a circle to the radius of a circle. Okay, so our double dot being our angular, excuse me, our radial acceleration is a length per time squared. It's like a meters per second squared just like gravitational acceleration. And then our angular acceleration, theta double dot, or alpha, is going to be in radians per second squared. So one cool thing about all of your angular velocities and angular accelerations is they're gonna have exactly the same units, no matter if you're in SI units or if you are in US customer units. Okay, so every single angular velocity in dynamics will be in radians per second. Every single angular acceleration will be in radians per second squared.
So that gives you an overview of the equations. Before I sign off from this video, we're gonna take a quick look at an interactive where you can see how these R and theta axis systems then compare to tangent and normal. So here is a GeoGebra interactive. The link to this interactive will be both right below the video on our Canvas homepage, as well as in the description below this video on YouTube. But what we can see here is if we have a particle and that particle is moving along a path, in this case, we have kind of a spiral path, that what we're gonna find is that our axis systems will vary in direction for tangent normal and cylindrical, but they don't vary in direction for Cartesian. Now associated with this particle is a vector. You can think of this as a position vector, a velocity vector, an acceleration vector. It's just a vector for right now, and we'll talk more about how we get those separate vectors. But Cartesian, we end up with the exact same axis system no matter where this particle is. Okay, now um, we of course see that the components of that vector can change because sometimes they're positive, sometimes they're negative. Uh, we can grab the tip of this vector and move it down here and flip these around, but just notice that the X and Y axes are always completely parallel um, no matter what the position of the particle is. Okay, now if we have a tangent normal axis system, we know that our tangential axis is always pointing basically tangential along this curve. Now, if the particle is moving this direction, our tangent would be going in the same direction as the component of that force vector. Now, if it's going back in the other direction, our tangential axis would flip direction and go the other direction. The normal would not change. The normal always is going toward the center of curvature, no matter where the particle is. Okay, so tangential can flip-flop with velocity, but the normal does not. But once again, we can divide these into components. And so if we knew that the particle was moving in this direction, these would both be positive, positive F sub T, positive F sub N. Um, if we had the particle going in this direction, but the force we were discussing or the vector we were discussing was going in the opposite direction, we would say that this is a negative F sub T and a positive F sub N. Okay, once again, so these are based upon the axis systems. To get into our third axis system, cylindrical, I'll go ahead and leave the, the tangent normal on here for right now. We can see there isn't often a huge difference between our tangent and our theta axis system, and then our normal and our R. One thing that is different between the normal and the R is normals go to, normal goes toward the center of curvature and the r goes away from the center of curvature so the sign would be different on these two terms so just one last look at this with just only the r and the theta we can see here that our theta axis of course whether it's positive or negative is going to line up in the direction of an increasing theta angle this particular example doesn't have a theta angle and that our r axis would be going away from that origin point okay so this would be a negative fr component and the F theta component would depend on the direction of the theta axis.